Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome back to our 2.30 update. Before I get into today's conversation, I want to address the ruling that came out of the Clay County Circuit Court yesterday. First, the stay-at-home order, designed in close consultation with scientists and public health experts, remains in place. As it stands, the judge's ruling is limited, applying only to one person, the state representative from the 109th District. For those unfamiliar, the 109th District happens to have among the lowest hospital bed availability and ventilators in the state, making it uniquely ill-equipped to respond to a surge in cases. The district is also home to the county experiencing Illinois' highest death rate per capita from COVID-19. This ruling only applies to one person because it was only ever about one person. This was a cheap political stunt designed so that the representative can see his name in headlines. And unfortunately, he has briefly been successful in that most callous of feats. As absurd as this charade is, is we, we are taking this matter very seriously. While the court's order is limited, the risk it poses is significant. By agreeing with the plaintiff in this initial ruling, the court set a dangerous precedent. Slowing the spread of this virus is critical to saving lives by ensuring our healthcare system has the resources to treat patients who get sick. And we will not stop this virus if, because of this ruling, any resident can petition to be exempted from aspects of the orders that rely on collective action to keep us all safe. Because of the threat to public health from this court order and the fact that the state has acted well within its legal authority to protect the health of the public, the state is appealing immediately. I know misinformation tends to spread quickly in situations like this, so I assure you that I will continue to provide you with updates on any new developments. But on this topic, I leave you with this. I know this virus is causing devastating economic consequences, just as it has caused tens of thousands to become ill and thousands to die. For two months, not a second has gone by where the economic impact on our working families and our small businesses hasn't been an important and paramount consideration of my decision making. I have been listening to working people and businesses, to Democrats and Republicans, epidemiologists and expert modelers. Responsible people understand the trade-offs and the consequences of reopening too early. So I will continue to listen and to act in a responsible fashion so we can all get back to work and school and move toward normal in a way that will keep our families healthy and safe. Let me remind everyone again, the stay at home order in Illinois is still very much in effect. All of us must maintain social distancing, wear masks in public, and keep non-essential businesses closed until we can lower our still increasing hospitalizations and lower our ICU bed use. The danger has not passed yet, no matter whether you live in Little Egypt or in Freeport or in Quincy or in Chicago. We are making much of progress and much of the progress that we had hoped to make, and we will not let one irresponsible state representative deter us from success. Now moving on to the business of actually keeping people safe. I'm here today with IDPH Director Dr. Ngazi Azike, of course, and the Illinois National Guard's 40th Adjutant General, Brigadier General Richard Neely, along with three special guests. It is my great honor to introduce on behalf of the Republic of Poland, Consul General Piotr Janicki, Defense Military, Naval and Air Attaché, Embassy of the Republic of Poland, Major General Cezary Wyszniski, and the medical team leader, Captain Jacek Szawera. This morning, 
General Neely and I joined the Polish medical delegation who arrived here in Illinois to assist with our COVID-19 response on Thursday, April 23rd in visiting our Illinois National Guard operations at our drive-through testing site in Harwood Heights. And I'm very grateful, truly grateful for their leadership and their ability to join us for today's update. The Illinois National Guard's state partnership program with the Polish military dates back to 1993, when Poland was still emerging from behind the Iron Curtain of the Cold War. And I'm proud to say that that partnership has grown to be the most robust and successful such partnership in the United States, involving multiple exchanges between Illinois and Poland each year. The Illinois National Guard leadership and service members have forged lasting relationships with Polish military leaders. Brigadier General Neely has made multiple trips to Poland and their leaders have made multiple trips to the United States as we learn from each other and help each other improve. That spirit of cooperation has also led to a series of boots on the ground partnerships. Since 2003, Illinois National Guard forces and Polish forces have co-deployed, first in Iraq and now in Afghanistan. And I'll add that our Illinois Emergency Management Director, Brigadier General Alicia Tate-Nadeau, actually co-deployed with Polish forces in Iraq as a part of one such mission. And just as we fought together in Iraq and Afghanistan, the Illinois National Guard and our longtime partners and friends in the Polish military have joined together once more in a fight against the global enemy of COVID-19. This is an exchange that represents the very best of humanity. Medical experts from different parts of the world coming together to save as many lives as possible no matter where they call home. The Guard and the entire state of Illinois welcome the assistance of the Polish medical delegation with open arms. These nine members, four doctors, three nurses, one EMT and one logistical coordinator, bring with them their experience fighting COVID-19 on the ground in Italy and Poland, which they now can exchange with the Illinois medical community so that everyone, both here in Illinois and thousands of miles away in Poland, is operating with the best practices to save lives. Since mid-March, the Illinois National Guard has provided vital capabilities to our state COVID-19 response. Currently, there are about 1,120 Illinois National Guard service members deployed throughout the state of Illinois on COVID-related missions. So what does this look like on the ground? Well, a prime example. These individuals have set up and continue to operate our five state-run community-based drive-through testing sites in Aurora, in Bloomington, Chicago, Markham, and Rockford, with more sites coming online in the near future. In a matter of days, the Guard takes what was just an empty parking lot or an old facility and sets up a testing site capable of serving hundreds of Illinoisans per day safely and efficiently. And they've done it five times now, all while maintaining the continuity of services at the sites they've already spun up. It is truly extraordinary work. On top of that, our Illinois National Guard is working with IEMA and IDPH to conduct state warehouse operations in central Illinois, reviewing any and all incoming shipments of personal protective equipment, PPE, and other necessary materials in our battle with this virus. All in all, they have helped to distribute hundreds of thousands of units of PPE and other vital materials to county health departments and hospitals throughout the state. The Guard is also supporting on-site medical operations in IDOC correctional centers at Stateville, Sheridan, and Galesburg prisons. And 
had been providing similar assistance to medical staff at our Illinois Department of Human Services developmental centers in Park Forest and Kankakee up until today. That mission was handed off last night as IEMA is deploying teams of certified nursing assistants and other staff to these centers. That might sound like a hefty list of tasks, but this is the Illinois National Guard that we're talking about. So, of course, that's just the beginning of the duties these incredible citizen soldiers have taken on to see Illinois through this crisis, because they're also providing logistical support for alternative housing facilities, such as the hotels IEMA has rented in Schaumburg, Springfield, and Mount Vernon, building out the alternate care facilities at McCormick Place and in Blue Island and Melrose Park in partnership with the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. And that's after having run the assessment of properties throughout the state of potential alternate care facility sites. Working with county emergency operations centers and health departments across the state by gathering information and assisting IEMA with interdepartment communications and providing planners, liaison officers, and logistics experts to the State Emergency Operations Center, the State Unified Area Command, north the Chicago uh, Office of Emergency Management and Communications, and Cook County's Emergency Operations Center. I'm incredibly humbled by the gracious spirit of these citizen soldiers who have left their families and their civilian jobs to assist their fellow Illinoisans. And what's more, to do so when time with family is one of many people's most precious everyday moments. They are the very best of Illinois. Thank you, and now I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Ngazi Azike for today's medical update. Doctor. Thank you, Governor. It's an honor to be here with our Governor, of course, and Brigadier General Neely, and also our Polish delegation, Chindobry. Chindobry. Uh, unfor uh, unfortunately, I also have to report that today we have surpassed 2,000 deaths here in Illinois, and we've seen the greatest one-day increase in fatalities thus far. Over the last 24 hours, 144 additional individuals with COVID-19 have passed, bringing our total to 2,125 individuals. Of the individuals who have lost their lives in the last 24 hours, 80% of them were from Northern Illinois, 14% from Southern Illinois, and 6% from Central Illinois. 44% were categorized as white, 28% were categorized as black, 13% categorized as Hispanic, and 8% categorized as Asian. We had total of 2,219 new cases for a total of 48,102 for the state of Illinois. Thus far, we have run 242,189 tests with 14,561 tests being run yesterday. Regarding hospital data, as of yesterday, 4,738 people in Illinois were reported to be hospitalized with COVID-19. That's up from 4,672 yesterday. Of those, roughly 25%, or 1,245 patients, were in the ICU, and 778 patients were on ventilators. Talking about recovery, I'd like to report that we've been continuing with our survey to identify people who report having a resolution of their symptoms after having a positive test. For those less than two weeks from the, t from the positive test, 49% report no longer having symptoms and feeling recovered. For people who are between two and four weeks from their positive test, 61% report feeling recovered. And after more than four weeks from the positive test, 74% of the respondents report being recovered. I hope that's seen as encouraging news that people do recover. We mourn the loss of all the lives and we're sorry for all of those who have had to endure a battle in the hospital, but the majority of individuals do recover. 
Our response to this coronavirus outbreak is complex and involves working with many traditional partners, but some new partners and new experts. I thank Governor Pritzker for his ongoing efforts and for leading by example as he ensures that Illinois is unified in this battle against COVID-19. We are working very closely with health and hospital systems, local health departments, long-term care facilities, as well as our sister agencies, the Illinois Emergency Management Agency, the State Police, the Department of Human Services, the Department of Corrections, the Illinois National Guard, and many more. We have pulled in experts from the health preparedness, medical, and public health fields. And we have wonderful new partners like our Polish delegation joining us today. And after my brief remarks in Spanish, I will turn it over to Brigadier General Neely. Buenos tardes y gracias, Gobernador. Seré breve hoy para que podamos oír a nuestros invitados hoy. Lamento reportar hoy que hemos superpasado los mil muertes aquí en Illinois y estamos viendo el aumento más grande en muertes hasta la fecha. Desde ayer, 148 personas más con COVID han muerto para un total de 2,125 muertes. También reportamos 2,229 casos nuevos de COVID-19 para un total de 48,102 casos en el estado de Illinois. Se han procesado 242,189 pruebas de COVID-19 en Illinois y de ellas 14,561 se procesaron ayer. Ayer se reportaron 4,738 hospitalizaciones de personas con COVID-19. Aproximadamente un cuarto de ellas, 1,245 pacientes estaban en uni unidades de cuidado intensivo y había 778 pacientes conectados a un respirador. También me gustaría reportar las recuperaciones. De los casos que se reportaron a IDPH en las últimas dos semanas, el 49% reportó que ya no tienen síntomas y se sienten, se sienten uh, recuperados. El 61% de casos que se reportaron a IDPH de dos a cuatro semanas atrás se reportaron recuperados. Y el 74% de los casos que se reportaron hace más de cuatro semanas reportaron que se sentían recuperados. Estas son noticias alentadoras. Nuestra respuesta al brote de coronavirus es compleja. Incluye trabajar junto a varios socios tra tradicionales, pero también con algunos expertos y socios no tradicionales. Estamos trabajando con los sistemas de salud y de hospitales, departamentos locales de salud, facilidades de cuidado a largo término y también con nuestras agencias hermanas. Hemos traído expertos de preparaciones para la sanidad pública médicos y expertos en otros campos de salud. También hay otros de quienes podemos aprender como la delegación de Polonia, quien nos acompaña hoy. Y ahora le entrego el podio a Richard Neely, ayudante general de la Guardia Nacional. And now I will turn it over to the Brigadier General Neely of the Illinois National Guard. Thank you, doctor. Good afternoon, Jim Dobre, to my Polish delegation and our Polish friends gathering with us online. Thank you, Governor, again for the invitation to join you today. And on behalf of the 13,000 guardsmen and women, thank you for your kind words, your phenomenal leadership and support of the Illinois National Guard, sir. Like you, I am tremendously proud of the men and women of the Illinois National Guard and their response to this pandemic. As you know, they are a capable force of soldiers and airmen who are proud to serve, but humble in their actions. The Illinois National Guard live throughout the state and yet deploy all around the world to fight our nation's wars. Currently, we have over a thousand members deployed across the globe. 
We also deploy throughout the state to support the citizens of Illinois when called upon. Much like we did this last summer during the historic flooding in both the south and west part of the state and in this response right now to COVID-19. As the governor stated earlier, currently we have about 1,100, a little more than 1,100 of our guardsmen depo deployed throughout the state supporting this response to the pandemic. As a part of the response today, it is a great honor to recognize the generosity of the Republic of Poland and President Duda for sending the medical team to the U.S. and in, most importantly, sending it here into Chicago and to share their expertise and experience with us. As highlighted by the governor, this team is made up of military and civilians, doctors, nurses, and EMTs. Not only has the team been in, very involved with the response to the COVID-19 throughout Poland, but also throughout Europe as they deployed to Italy to support that response as well. This type of support is a testament to the 26, almost 27 year relationship between the Illinois National Guard and the Polish military through the state partnership program. The Department of Defense, in cooperation with the State Department, established this relationship between the Illinois National Guard and the Polish military through the state partnership program in 1993. Illinois had one of the very first programs in the National Guard and as I stated, as, as well as the governor, we believe the best because the incredible partnership built between the Republic of Poland. Over these almost 27 years, the Illinois National Guard has had more than 400 training events with the Polish military, including exercises, leadership exchanges and engagements, and integration of major weapon, weapon systems, such as the F-16 and C-130 aircraft that the Illinois National Guard has flown. This relationship has grown and become more of a bilateral relationship as Poland has joined with NATO and has grown to be a very powerful uh, country within Europe. The governor, as the governor stated, the best example of this relationship is the co-deployments that we've had since 2003. The Polish military and the Illinois National Guard have deployed together into Iraq and later into Afghanistan as a single unit with the Illinois National Guard embedding personnel within the Polish, uh, Polish Brigade. These rotations have occurred every six months for the last 17 years and are still ongoing today. We have fought side by side for many years and now we fight the pandemic together. Today we are deeply moved by the incredible act of kindness and support from our friends from Poland, joining us here in Chicago to share their experiences and expertise in fighting this disease and offering to lend a hand to, at the local hospitals. Also, a big thank you to the Consulate General for his incredible assistance to help with this event in Chicago. And thank you to our Polish defense attache Major General Wyszynski for his direct engagement with the Polish military to coordinate this visit. As the only state to have this type of cooperation, I'm very proud of the Illinois relationship with the country of Poland. Thank you again, and I will be followed by the Consulate General. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Governor, for letting us be here. Uh, thank you for your leadership. Uh, uh, thank you for your leadership as well, uh, General Neely. It is my great pleasure to uh, be here. And uh, we are feeling that uh, we are very welcomed here. Uh, from early on, from 19th century, when uh, uh, a group of uh, Polish immigrants uh, came to Chicago. They start building this city. They start building this uh, state and look around. Uh, Chicago is uh, great. And now we are facing uh, a great challenge. We have to fight uh, coronavirus. And uh, I cannot imagine a, um, a better place uh, for military um, um, personnel from Poland uh, than Chicago to come and help. Uh, we want to be here. We want to share our expertise. We would like to 
um, also exchange uh, what we've learned somewhere else. Um, a, a lot of those uh, doctors who came here, um, they uh, were previously uh, deployed to uh, northern Italy where they were facing uh, very similar uh, ch challenges. Um, there's no, no surprise that we want to be here because uh, Chicago is the most American of all the American cities, but it also happens to be uh, the most Polish uh, of all the American cities. Um, about 8% uh, of all the Illinoisans are of Polish descent. Uh, among them are people who are suffer because of this uh, disaster. Um, so we are here to prevent the coronavirus from spreading and we are hoping that uh, the efforts of the medical personnel will help with those uh, efforts. Um, among uh, those uh, skilled uh, doctors that are uh, visiting from Poland are famous uh, cardiologists, uh, famous anesthesiologists. So uh, we are also helping hands-on, uh, not just uh, sharing our expertise. Uh, and I know uh, Illinois is uh, under a, a huge uh, pressure like uh, the rest of the country um, because uh, now the pandemic is spreading um, throughout uh, United S uh, States. Uh, thank you again for your leadership. Uh, thank you for uh, allowing us to, to be here. And if there is a chance to help, uh, Polish military is famous to join. And uh, we are face to fight and we are also first to come and help. Thank you. And at this point, I would like to give the podium back to Governor Pritzker. Thank you very much, Piotr. Thank you very much, Council General, and um, I'd be happy to answer any questions. I guess that would be for me, Governor. Um, I have a whole ton of them from the, uh, my colleagues out there. Um, <coughs> Greg Bishop from Center Square says, uh, say Rep. Darren Bailey says, local health departments are the authority to decide quarantine situations, so there's due process with those affected why isn't that the way that this should be handled instead of the statewide approach? Mm -hmm. um, local health departments certainly have lots of authority. They can uh, they can put in more stringent uh, rules than the state does. That's certainly true. Uh, but the state of Illinois has a, a public health act uh, and has an emergency management act that allows us to protect all of the people of the state, um, thinking about every region of the state, which I am and we are. Um, Tamon Bradley, WGN asks, uh, if you can explain the Department of Public Health's quarantine authority and will you now turn to those powers giving the judges temporary restraining order if you believe you need to? Well, we're not, there is no quarantine authority that's being exercised here. There's a stay at home order. There are executive orders that are in, in, uh, in place uh, to effectuate the protection of all of our citizens. Um, I'm not sure what the, if there was some other point to the question. Well, I think what he was speaking of, uh, the judge's ruling yesterday said in essence, by limiting people to what they can go outside and do so you, you can go to the grocery store but you can't go fishing that is in effect a quarantine on in the ruling representative darren bailey you don't believe this applies at all in that regard is what you're saying well what i know is that our our you know we it's called a stay-at-home order there is no mandate that people have to stay quarantined in their home that's not what a, the stay-at-home order says. Um, that's the name of the order. But the order, in fact, says that uh, we're you know, designed to protect families and individuals all across the state um, following guidelines from our federal Homeland Security Department, um, where we've essentially authorized essential businesses to keep operating, but we've asked non-essential businesses uh, to close, and we've asked people to wear masks, and we've asked people to uh, to make sure and protect each other uh, across the state by uh, keeping social distancing norms. Uh, and that's all of what those orders are about. Uh, but again, it's the authority of the Emergency Management Act, of the Public Health Act, um, and it is the history uh, of the state of Illinois that we have sometimes successive 
declarations of disaster in the state. A good example is floods that have occurred in the past, which, you know, remember, emergencies don't have a time bound to them necessarily. Sometimes they do. A tornado can come and go, and the emergency can be, you know, declared and has a time bound to it. Floods tend not to. Pandemics, which we haven't experienced in Illinois for a hundred years, uh, pandemics don't live by a 30-day time frame. And so all we're trying to do is to end our uh, uh, disaster, our uh, executive orders as soon as possible, but with the thought in mind that we need to keep people safe until we're able to do that. To that point, uh, Tom DeVore, who represents Darren Bailey, uh, told me today that just because there have been continuing proclamations in the past that have never been challenged in court doesn't set precedent for the court to accept that as a legal exercise of authority. Can you respond to that? All I would say is he should read the statute. The statute allows the governor to declare uh, an emergency uh, for 30 days at a time. Um, and if the, there is a, an emergency that occurs, uh, you know, this emergency declaration goes till April 30th. I'm not sure what he's suggesting, but on May 1, if there is an emergency on May 1, then it is the authority of the governor to declare an emergency as a disaster proclamation on May 1 for 30 days. Um, but, but look, let's not get into the, uh, you know, the, the uh, back and forth. Here's the facts. We are defeating this virus by virtue of having a stay-at-home order. Um, you, will, you can hear from Dr. Zike and others that there would have been thousands more deaths in the state, and there will be thousands of deaths if this executive order is not allowed to proceed on May 1 uh, through May 30th. Um, so, I, I, you know, all I can say is that it is the height of recklessness that uh, that attorney and his client uh, have gone ahead and challenged the idea that we're in the middle of an emergency. Remember, Donald Trump, the president of the United States, uh, has declared a national emergency. We are uh, one of the United States, and uh, we too have declared a disaster. Just one follow up and then I'll move on to the other questions because it appears we're going to have a second lawsuit filed by a Republican uh, uh, Representative uh, Cabela. It's similar claims. I don't know, I haven't seen it yet, but we're told that's going to happen today. So now we have a second Republican from upstate challenging this. Do you have a concern that this is going to have a snowball effect and that there's going to be a lot more lawsuits challenging this? And is this going to go to the Supreme Court eventually? Well, it appears to me to be some partisan endeavor. Um, and I, at a moment when, frankly, political parties shouldn't matter at all. Um, we should be focused on simply doing what's best for our people, keeping them safe and healthy. Um, but I, I don't know, certainly people have the ability, anybody has the ability to go to court. Um, but I know that uh, we, have, uh, we have appealed this uh, ruling uh, in Clay County, in the local court, circuit court in Clay County, it's been appealed, um, and our hope is that, the, and it's, you know, the Supreme Court's been asked to take up the matter, and so, you know, my hope is that we can move swiftly just to move this out of the way, because we have so much to do. We have so much to do to keep people safe, and wasting our time and effort on these ridiculous lawsuits is something that I think is just, it's, it's, it's something that we shouldn't have to do, and, and shameful acts on the parts of these uh, partisan actors. Moving on to some other things, Dana Rebick from WGN uh, is hoping you could comment on the City View Multi Care Center in Cicero, where there are 163 residents and 30 staff who have tested positive, five deaths. According to Cicero officials, City View has racked up 10 citations since the pandemic started, many involving the improper or inadequate use of PPE by employees. We're told the state health department has stepped in with mass testing. Is there? Can you comment on the current situation at that facility and what is management in the state doing to protect residents there? I'll have to get back to you. I, d I don't have the details of that particular facility. We, as you know, we have nearly 1,200 facilities across the state, so it's hard to, to keep track of any one facility. I, I don't know if Dr. Zika has anything to add or no. Okay. I uh, did have a question for Dr. Zika from my colleague, uh, Sarah Schulte. Um, if you could give an update on positive cases and deaths at the state-run Ludeman Development Center, and also is the state providing appropriate PPE for that staff? Yes, I'm, I'm in contact with the secretary of the de 
uh, of the Department of Human Services. We're working closely together to make sure that the needs are being met. Of course, it's really hard to keep track of uh, the numbers for all of the facilities. We have hundreds of outbreaks throughout the state commit, you know, going along with this pandemic. So um, I think those details can be provided. But yes, we're working closely. Uh, this is one of our sister agency facilities. We're trying to make sure they have everything they need to make sure that they can get this under control. A couple of questions for you, Dr. Zike. Um, if I can keep you up there, uh, these are for my colleagues over at Univision. Um, there's uh, Talk about quarantine fatigue or caution fatigue with mental health experts uh, saying it could really start to kick in. Um, you know, can you comment on that? And, and can these actually hurt people's efforts to stay safe? No, of course. We know um, it's a big sacrifice that we are asking people. Uh, of course, we're trying to do it with their best intentions, with the public health in mind. Trust me, no one wants to tell people to stay at home. No one wants people to not be able to enjoy our, our beautiful state. Um, it is with a lot of reflection and the use of data that we are using, taking these aggressive actions, and they're actually working. Uh, we know that we have flattened the curve. We know we have decreased the rate of rise of the number of people who've gotten infected, which means that we've decreased the number of people who will be hospitalized and have passed on. I unfortunately cannot prevent every fatality, but we can decrease the numbers as much as we can. And so I know that people are getting tired. We all uh, are tired of this pandemic. The enemy, the common enemy is the virus. It's it's not the people, it's not public health that's trying to keep people safe. It's not the governors working so hard to help us manage these uh, community mitigation strategies. We all need to try to hang in there so that we can prevent the loss of life of our loved ones and, and ourselves. Is there some worry about the, the toll that this constant state of fear could have on people and the, the stress that it's creating on residents? Definitely, that's that's a very real thing, um, and that's why we've had the 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 call the call lines to help people with some mental health resources. Um, we hope that others are able to check on friends and others who may be more predisposed to having uh, further mental health uh, exacerbations. It is a trying time. No one is going to deny that being in for this long and not not being able to connect with people physically, which is a, an important and normal human, uh, normal desire. Uh, all of that is being interrupted, but for the greater good of being able to not lose lives. And hopefully uh, when we can come out of this, you know, we will have to address uh, some of these issues. Um, hopefully people can reach out and get some telehealth and telemental health in the meantime. But uh, again, we're, we're not trying to unduly punish people. We're actually trying to work on the society's best interest. While I have you up there, a couple of questions came in from Amy Jacobson uh, from WIND directed for you. Um, of the new cases, how many uh, live in nursing homes or prisons, if you can say that, and is, is, isn't that a good indicator of community spread? And there's a follow-up question, but I'll let you address that. Okay. So again, I don't have all of those numbers immediately uh, on me. Uh, yes, we know that a significant number of uh, fatalities and cases come from nursing homes, as we said at the very beginning of this, that our top concern was going to be congregate facilities, just by the nature of how those those settings are with people living in the same space, harder to socially distance, uh, harder harder to have, uh, you know, the spacing that we would want uh, in some facilities where you have people who are developmentally uh, challenged. There's an additional uh, difficulty in trying to get the, the residents to understand uh, some of the instructions that are being given. So uh, between long-term care facilities, you know, group homes, prisons and jails, that has always been our biggest challenge. We're seeing the same problem across the entire country. It's not unique to Illinois. These are things that we know whenever there are outbreaks, uh, those are settings that hit, get hit hardest. Um, and then the follow-up to that, Doctor, if you could, one more time, and then I think we'll get to the governor. Um, it, the How question many more was, you have, Craig? I, I'm the full report. I'm just, I know, I'm but I got a lot online. You too. got a lot online. Yeah. Well, let me let me let me move on. There's some for the governor um, that have come in from a couple other uh, TV reporters. Elizabeth Matthews, governor. With um, I just want to add to that last question that you can find those numbers on the IDPH website. Dr. ZK may not know them by heart every day. Okay. Um, so, uh, Governor, now that uh, testing is ramped up, this is from Elizabeth Matthews with WFLD. Uh, when can we see contact tracing start to be part of the solution? Do you have a timeline for that? 
Um, and then also the White House is promising to give the state 20,000 testing swabs per day in May. Is that going to be enough? Will it happen? Um, listen, I am uh, thrilled that the White House is, is going to provide 20,000 swabs a day. I was on the phone this morning with Admiral Girard on that very subject, and uh, you know, it's, it's, it will be a great advancement for us to have 20,000 more opportunities to, to, uh, to get testing up and going. Um, the first part was just an expansion. The contact tracing, yeah. uh, you know, now so testing's I, wrapped up. Yeah. yeah, also after that discussion with uh, Admiral Girard, I had a meeting with our contact tracing team, um, and that is something that we're working very hard to uh, spin up to get going uh, in a in a large way. It, you know, as you know, there are a lot of components to that. There's a technology component. There's a hiring component. Um, this is a, a very large endeavor. When you have more than 2,000 people that are being identified every day as a result of more testing, we now have more cases that are identified. And each one of those people may, for example, have had 10 contacts or more. And so you can imagine every single single day and then pile on top of that that you're monitoring the people who are in quarantine or in isolation, I should say, once they've been contacted and asked to go into isolation um, or given options about what they're going to do. So th it's a very large endeavor, and we would be the second state to have a very large uh, contact tracing uh, initiative uh, take place. So I'm, 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 I'm kind of I'm pushing hard on the team. They know it uh, for us to get that going because that's the other or another of the major components that allows us to open up the economy even more. What about antibody testing? Is that going to be more widely available anytime soon? And how confident are you in all that? Yeah, we, we would like to do antibody testing, but I, as I said the other day, um, the tests are still as yet somewhat unproven or, you know, the sensitivity is in question uh, still. And there are lots of articles about that. Um, um, we want to make sure that when we start doing antibody testing that we're giving people accurate results and that we know what the impact is. Because, you know, one of the things that we still don't know is if, in fact, you are immune after you've had COVID-19. And so doing antibody testing was intended to give people that information. So we don't want to start that until we have at least a, a greater medical basis upon which to uh, give people that information. I had two more, and yep. then I will pass the, the microphone over. This is from John O'Connor with the AP. Um, he says, regarding your comments yesterday on the Bailey lawsuit, are you really that contemptuous of the judiciary or the right of citizens or even a legislator to go to court to challenge an executive's power in this country? You said that Bailey is grandstanding. Isn't that what you were doing when you called him reckless and said his actions would make people sick? Okay, that's just a ridiculous question. I, I'm not even sure how to answer it. No, I know. I'm, I'm responding to, to Mr. O'Connor. Um, uh, first of all, I have great respect for the judiciary. Uh, second of all, I absolutely think it's people's right to go to court. Um, third of all, what I'm calling reckless is the idea and the contention that's been made by this state representative that uh, somehow uh, we're intending to limit people's civil liberties or that we're intending uh, to take away people's rights. That's not the intention here. The intention, in fact, is to save people's lives. Uh, so it is reckless uh, in the extreme for a state representative who should know better to, uh, to bring a lawsuit like that uh, that he knows might have a terrible effect on the health and safety of people all across the state. That's what's reckless. He, he should be more responsible than that. Anybody can go to court. Absolutely anybody can go to court. But the fact that he took that uh, case to court uh, and that he was the plaintiff in that case, uh, that he's the one giving, uh, you know, interviews about why, uh, you know, people's rights have been taken away and, and claiming somehow that this is unconstitutional. I mean, he should know, but he should read the statutes. That's what he should do. And final question. Uh, Amanda Vinicky with TGW. And I assume this uh, applies to the lawsuit. Uh, what is the Department of Public Health going to do in the event that the state loses in this lawsuit? Uh, and do local health departments have the capacity to, to deal with the situation? The uh, Public Health Act actually gives us most of the authority to um, to to make sure that those restrictions are in place. Um, other aspects of the law give us other uh, powers, too. So, um, so it would be you know, somewhat, um, I, I mean, it's hard to speculate exactly uh, whether or not 
this case would go anywhere else. Uh, I do not believe that the courts uh, will allow this ruling to stand, and I do believe that the courts will overturn it. Kelly at Block Club. Uh, it is illegal to sell pre-mixed cocktails to go in Chicago, but bar owners say they need those sales to survive. Lightfoot said it's a state issue. Are you considering pushing to make it legal? I don't know that it's a state issue. I haven't thought about mixed drinks being served at the curb, but I'm happy to look into it. Uh, Andrew Davis from the Windy City Times. The FDA recently reduced the time for blood donations from gay and bisexual men from a year to three months. Is there a movement from governors to totally eliminate this ban, given how badly blood donations are needed? Yeah, this is something the federal government has imposed. That's not something that I would support uh, as a governor, but unfortunately, this is a federal law. Shia Politico, Governor, to what extent is COVID-19 dividing the state? Has increased partisan? Has it increased partisan divide? Um, I think there was a poll yesterday that showed that the vast majority of people in the state support, whether they're Democrats or Republicans, support the stay-at-home order. Um, and uh, so I, I, I don't think it's, there's a partisan divide. I do think that there are a few people who are trying to take political advantage at the moment in the middle of the pandemic that is killing people. They're politicizing it. Jim Leach at WMAY. Governor, you've extended sales tax deadlines for bars and restaurants. Are similar accommodations in the works for other businesses? Is, are other businesses tax relief options on the table? We certainly are talking to the General Assembly um, about that. You know, there are other things that I think we could do, um, but th those are in the works and I don't have anything to announce today. Uh, Jim Haggerty has a question for Dr. Azike. Can you talk briefly about how to safely wear a mask or face covering in public for people who may be worried about cross-contamination? Uh, for the face coverings, uh, depending on uh, what it's made out of, it's usually recommended that it be washed every day. So if someone has had the ability to make one, maybe if they ma could make a couple so that they could be uh, recycled uh, while they're being washed, you could use the second one or the third one. Um, regarding our, you know, whether it's the N95 mask, I have seen uh, individuals in public with those, and I just want to caution that those are um, supposed to have, be be accompanied by a medical screening uh, and an appropriate fit test so that you make sure you see you're using the right size to make sure that it doesn't have leaks and so that it's actually effective. And so when those are used uh, without the proper uh, fit testing and medical screening, for instance, it shouldn't be worn with a beard or excessive facial hair and the wrong size could not give you the protection that's uh, anticipated. So there are specific rules around that. Um, regarding uh, maybe the surgical mask, uh, ideally, uh, you would uh, make sure that it's a, if it's the straps, you put it around the ears. Obviously, if it's worn under your chin, it's not helping. If it's worn over just the mouth and not covering the nose, you're also uh, missing out on its effectiveness. And ideally, those uh, would be changed frequently. And be sure not to try to touch uh, too many surface of, surfaces of it without also uh, washing your hands or hand sanitizing. Doctor, you could stay up there because there's another question about clarifying the pools and whether or not why those are not open um, during the pandemic? Well, I, I think, um, you know, again, swimming and pools are a summer pastime that everyone would like to feel that they're back to normal and being able to enjoy the, the normal things of the summer. Um, again, we, we're still learning a lot about this virus, uh, but in terms of pools in general, we know that the the settings of pools, whether it's public pools or private pools, usually involves mass gatherings almost by definition. Uh, lots of people congregating together, whether in the water or poolside. Um, so there are for many reasons that we probably need to get to a certain uh, point in our uh, epidemiologic curve before we could probably consider that. Ryan from WGLT in Bloomington. Our state-run drive-up testing site is still underutilized in Bloomington, averaging about 100 people per day and capacity is 250. Asymptomatic workers supporting critical infrastructure are still not allowed to be tested there despite state guidance that says they should be. What's the holdup on loosening those restrictions there? Well, we, we have a limited number of tests and capability across the state. And so, you know, to the extent that um, as we're focused today on 
uh, people who are symptomatic or are first responders and other essential workers, um, there again is still a limited number of tests available. Um, we would hope that more people would go to that site, but I do want to remind uh, the questioner that uh, actually in Bloomington, what we've seen is there are a lot of other sites that are available for people, and that is one of the reasons why people are not going to that site, um, is they, they have the ability to go to uh, other healthcare facilities that, that have testing available. Mark Maxwell wants to know what your backup plan is to continue to fight COVID-19 in the event the courts restrain your executive orders, which you've already mentioned, but he also has a second part. Mm -hmm. If it's not clear the law gives you the powers you feel you need, why not call an emergency session now? Yeah, I, I am reasonably confident that the, that the uh, uh, responsible members of the judiciary will, uh, will overrule uh, and overturn, rather, the ruling that came from this one judge. Cheryl Corley at NPR asks, Friday, Governor, you mentioned that an order for 30,000 isolation gowns had been made. What's the status of that order? And can Dr. Azike talk about how hospitals are handling any shortage of gowns? Uh, I don't know the specific status of that order. We, we have lots of orders for millions of, of items of PPE, but it is true that the gowns are across the country uh, in shortage. Uh, so we've been very careful about the usage of gowns um, and uh, monitoring the availability of them in healthcare facilities and elsewhere where they're needed. But happy to turn the second part of that to. So, so we know that with this pandemic, we are uh, in in a stage where we have implemented like crisis care guidelines and associated with crisis care guidelines means that you might have to use tactics that you don't usually use to make sure that you extend the resources, the limited resources that may be available. So I guess in pre-COVID times, outside of COVID times, uh, we would use an N95 mask one time and you could potentially discard it. Uh, you would use, um, you know, there are many different supplies that maybe you would use after a single use and then use multiple per day. Uh, because if we had used, uh, used our supplies at that rate uh, with this pandemic, we would have been completely out of supplies now and then you would have frontline workers, healthcare workers with no supplies whatsoever. And so because of that, uh, the CDC has also recommended and said that, you know, these, you know, qualify as times where you would extend the use of your uh, supplies. So that could mean, uh, you know, decontaminating the N95s. We do have uh, an offsite location where uh, the N95s can be sent to be decontaminated and returned. Uh, they can be used maybe longer than a day, several days before before they're changed to a new one, assuming that there's not obvious soiling or obvious uh, you know, bodily fluids that have contaminated it. So those measures are in place at this time. Samantha from Chalkbeat, Chicago released school level budgets today and they included a $125 million increase. With dire forecasts in other cities about school funding, are budget increases wise? I, I can't even answer the question because we don't yet know, uh, working with the legislature, whether we'll be able to increase education funding at all, but, but I, I hope that we will be. Okay. Dan Petrella will be our last question from the Tribune. Are you considering any additional duties for the Guard as part of the COVID response? In Connecticut, for example, Guard members are being deployed to aid with nursing home inspections. Is that something we could see here? Well, let me just begin by saying uh, to Dan Petrella that I read the piece that he posted uh, today about his aunt, the loss of his aunt, uh, and I just want to tell you how very sorry I am for your personal loss. Um, absolutely, the National Guard has been tremendous. I mean, everything we've asked them to do, they've done uh, with a, uh, just, a, you know, the execution has been amazing. Uh, they are excellent at everything that they do. We will be asking the National Guard to do new things. Um, it may be that we'll ask them to help us with nursing homes more than they already are. Uh, as you know, we've deployed them to prisons. We've deployed them to uh, testing sites. We've had them really in virtually everything that we're doing. 
doing uh, in fighting this pandemic. They've been somehow involved. And so I, I, there's no doubt that we'll continue to use the National Guard. Uh, and I, I just, I, you know, I've said it many times, but I'm just so proud of these young men and women um, and their relationship with the, the Polish military, uh, which when I became governor, I learned so much more about. And I must say, it, it gives, it's a point of real pride for the state of Illinois to have this kind of a relationship with the, the kind of excellent military operation of uh, Poland. And of course, because we have so many Polish uh, Americans uh, here in the city of Chicago, it's a great point of pride, especially for them. So thank you very much for everything that you're doing. Thank you, Consul General. And thank you all very much. Is any other questions? No. Nope. Thank you very much. Thanks for watching, and if you haven't already, please consider subscribing to our channel. And while you're at it, please leave us a comment. Thank you for watching.